Hey there, I'm Josh, and welcome back to the Lord of the Rings Artifacts of Arda. In the last episode, we focused on the moment that Bilbo gives his iconic sword Sting to his nephew Frodo. In the scenes that follow, we see the Fellowship set out from Rivendell, beginning their quest to take the ring to Mordor. Throughout their long, difficult trek through the wilderness, we get to witness not only the breathtaking beauty of Middle-earth, but also some nice little character moments. Some sneaky aerial spying by Saruman. And a glimpse of the corruptive temptation put out by the ring. Following along, we see the companions attempting to traverse the pass of Caradhras, being thwarted by that tricksy jerk Saruman. It is then that they reluctantly decided to take an alternate route by passing through the mines of Moria. They come to the gates of Moria, and while trying to remember the passphrase to open it, a couple of little troublemakers disturb the water and the Watcher waiting within. With the help of Gandalf, Frodo is able to decipher the password to be Bellot. the elvish word for friend. The Watcher in the water attacks and forces the company into the mines, destroying the gates and sealing them within. The Fellowship travels deeper into the mines and finds themselves in the room which houses the final resting place of Gimli's cousin, Balin. The tomb is surrounded by bones, weapons, and armor, the remnants of a last bitter struggle by the dwarves. While Gandalf reads the final few entries of a discovered journal, Pippin, ever the inquisitive one, inspects the skeleton of a dwarf sitting atop a well. And by inspects, I mean, you know, he sees the piercing arrow protruding from the skeleton and thinks, hey, let's give it a twist. Well, unsurprisingly, the skeleton, along with his helmet and a bucket, tumble down the well, making a horrible, loud ruckus. This resounding cacophony echoes through the depths, alerting those within to the whereabouts of our fellowship. The companions hastily prepare for the coming onslaught cautiously peering through the cracks to see that they have a cave troll. It is here in this ensuing battle that we see one of my favorite moments from all the films and the basis for today's project, where I will attempt to replicate one of the most powerful weapons in all of Middle Earth. I think I'm getting the hang of this. That's right, I'm gonna be making Sam's frying pan. Now, I could have just taken an old, beat-up, real frying pan and fixed it up to look like Sam's, but I didn't want to cheat and cut corners, so I decided to make one completely from scratch, out of clay, wire, and a bit of wood. So, let's get started and see how this turns out. For my rendition of Sam's frying pan, I started with a piece of plywood. I first cut it into a square. Then, drawing lines between the diagonal corners, I found the exact center at the intersection of the lines. I punched the center for a pilot and then drilled a hole. Next, I got out the nifty jig that I'll use to cut the square into a circle. I loosened the locking bolt and then flipped around the guide to install the pivot pin. Then I flipped the guide back around, found the correct measurement that I was wanting, and retightened the locking bolt. I placed the square blank onto the pin and then began making a series of cuts. If you've seen me do this before in past videos, I apologize for the redundancy. But I thought it would be good to give a little refresher on how this is done. To be clear, this jig is not my design. That credit belongs to a much smarter man than me, Drew Fisher. So go check out his channel. The dude knows what he's doing. Now since I had the bright idea to make this frying pan mainly out of clay, I had to have a sort of armature or skeleton to it. So starting with the wooden blank, I then used a circular metal grate that you would use for a grill. I stapled one to the bottom of the blank and then one to the top as well. I then tried to bend all the edges and join them together, making them rounded, you know, like a frying pan. Next I took a rectangular grill grate folded it over on itself to make the handle of the pan. Once I got it folded tightly together, I clamped the end of it into the bench vise and bent it over to give it a curve. 
Next, I attach the handle by sliding it in between the two round curl panels. I secured it by inserting several pieces of wire, looping them around and then twisting them together. I then inserted another wire and laced it through all the holes, and finished by twisting the ends nice and tight to secure the handle to the pan. Next, it was time to start rolling out the clay. Since I didn't really want to mess up my wife's rolling pin, I made a makeshift one using a piece of scrap PVC pipe. I rolled the clay out nice and flat, and then began applying it onto the pan. I was careful to take my time and push it all into place. Though I don't really want to take my time showing it because that gets rather monotonous. Once all the clay was in place, I allowed some dry time and then used a wet rag to rub it down and smooth it all out. Again, this process took some time to get it looking just right, and I had to add some extra clay in some spots. I repeated this process over the entire pan until I got it looking how I wanted. And although this pan ended up being pretty light once the clay was dry, I can assure you this sucker was just as heavy as a cast iron one while this clay was still wet. Cause good grief did I use a lot of clay. I added some finishing cosmetic touches before allowing the whole thing to dry for several days. And even though some extra cracks did form throughout the drying time, I took care of them by smoothing them out with some water as necessary. Once the clay was all dry, I got started on painting. I gave it a good solid coat of primer to begin with. Once the primer was dry, I gave it two good coats of metallic antique pewter spray paint. Next up, it was time to add some weathering. I did this by first applying a pretty healthy dose of black shoe polish. I laid it on pretty thick and then wiped away most of the excess. I started with the main cooking area and then repeated the process on the handle and the bottom of the pan. After finishing with the shoe polish, I moved on to applying some silver rub and buff, being sure to focus on specific areas, mainly on most of the edges and the rivets and the handle. I did pay special attention to add some extra detail to the bottom of the pan. This is, after all, where Sam would be scraping it across all the rocks and coals to cook their meals. I also added some extra silver on the tip of the bent hook on the handle of the pan, since this would be getting scuffed up from every time that Sam had to stow or remove the pan from his travel pack. I added some extra finishing touches wherever I thought it was needed, and then this pan was all done. To say that I'm extremely proud of how this project turned out wouldn't be the exact claim that I would make. After all, it looks like a beat up old frying pan, and not really anything special. However, it is by design supposed to look like it is quite unrefined. A piece of well used cookware that can be used as a makeshift weapon, made using old world smithing techniques not some refined weaponry made by an elvish master blacksmith. It is a blunt instrument, sturdy and reliable, much like the hobbit who carries it. You know, from that perspective, I am actually proud of it. This pan is pretty cool. Well, this was a very odd project to make. It definitely would have been easier to customize an old, real pan but I thought it'd be neat to stick with my theme of making these props out of alternative materials. And although at the end of the day, this is just an old frying pan, I still like how it turned out, and it certainly replicates one of the most powerful weapons in all of Middle Earth. But what do you guys think? Let me know in the comments below. That's it for this one. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you on the next episode of The Lord of the Rings Artifacts of Arda.